To figure out my baud rate issue with the uh, with the Nabu, um, I'm gonna build a little adapter. But while I was doing it, I was just sitting down and I was reading some YouTube comments, and I thought to myself, you know what? I'm gonna respond to something because it's kind of interesting that people are getting excited about software in a hardware world, right? Because a lot of you guys are all hardware based. So I think that's pretty neat. Um, the conversation really was about threading, and my last video was about how I was experiencing. Um, performance issues because the uh, on, on slow computers, like the Raspberry Pi, like the Raspberry Pi Zero, I should specify, okay? And I mean, that's a really, really slow computer because I was updating, I had a status bar in the main display and the status bar was being updated. And uh, people were saying, oh, well, it's, you should run that in a different thread. And <laughs> yes, you, you should run that in a different thread and you always will. Um, or I'm gonna explain something about threads because I don't know if uh, it's super clear to a lot of people because why would you come across it? So when people write programs um, that are graphical specifically, you don't wanna put all your code inside of the actual event for a button. So we should first talk about what a thread is. So let's, uh, let's do what we did um, yesterday, which was super successful. Everyone loved my fantastic art drawings. So <laughs> we'll do the same thing here. Oh, I can resize this. Oh, paint. Look at you go, girl. Okay. So first off, you have two different types of threads. A lot of people in the hardware world, they think of CPU threads. And that is totally different than a, than a, uh, a software thread. So CPU thread also is a cinnamon, synonym, <laughs> it's a synonym, synonym for a, for a core. Okay. So, um, they, it just means that you can have like four separate physical things running at the same time or eight or 16, whatever you have. Right. And that's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about CPU threads. We're talking about software threads. So in a computer, you have your main screen and I'm not going to draw. I'll just put it here. Okay. Oops. How do I go back to being a drawing mode? There we go. Okay. So you have your main screen and your main screen has, um, a bunch of windows in it and a mouse cursor, right? <laughs> and all of these windows are programs and they are each in their own thread, okay? And the main window itself is also in its a thread. We'll so just say it's like thread zero. We're just making up thread IDs, okay? And when one program dies, that's why other programs can keep running, all right? So what's actually kind of interesting is on the old Mac OS, the main thread that ran the display ran every program too. So every program actually took a piece of this main thread. So if a thread, if an application was doing code inside of a button, for example, in a button event, it would actually crash the entire computer. Interesting, eh? So anyway, that's a side note. So that means that it's running on its own little thread, which is its own little program. Now, that's its, called its GUI thread. So when a program execution begins, um, so we'll just say start, it runs into this entry point, which is usually your main function. And then your main function calls usually some delegate, which allows your, uh, your graphics, we'll say your GUI, to start rendering. And this GUI, pushes itself to the, op the OS's um, graphic renderer, okay? Which allows you to have windows. Now, this is all one thread, okay? I didn't put a T here, thread. Well, I'm gonna actually try writing it. Look at that, yeah. Okay, so in your GUI, you might have a window. And in this window, you have a button. And when somebody pushes that button, an event is raised which runs some event with some code in it, okay? Now, if you put logic code inside of here, like for example, a loop that is processing a bunch of information, this is actually still running on the same thread, okay? So you're still on the same thread that the GUI is. So that's why if you ever run a program and you click the button and the whole program locks up, that's what's happening is people put the code, the logic code of the application inside of like the actual event for this button. So really when people are saying to me, put it in a different thread, 
which of course is something that I would be doing, um, is that inside of your, there's two ways to do it. One way is you can have, um, you can actually launch a new thread, okay, a new software thread. And that gets a new ID, a thread ID. It runs on its own and it runs parallel. Well, not even parallel, it just runs, right? There's no synchronous between them. And the other way is there's a bunch of, it's, it's still like running a thread, but you can run methods that are called async. And async methods um, are really expensive, super expensive. And they essentially, for every command, they will launch their own thread and go do some work. Now, there's some brains behind how async works, so I don't really wanna get into it too much, but if there's, for example, if there's no return value, then it assumes that this thread can just run on its own. If there's a return value and the, the compiler will analyze where that return value is being used, it will actually allow other code to run. And then when this program is, uh, is completed, let's say further down here, it'll pass the return to where it needs to go. So this, it'll actually, this will wait until this is completed, but this stuff will keep running. So there is some intelligence inside of how async works, and a lot of programmers get caught up on it. In fact, um, actually, let me show you something. So we have uh, at, at my company, my new company, um, we do robot software. And in our robot software, we have uh, a graphic interface and everything, but we also work a lot with machine learning. We work with different companies, universities that are doing machine learning. Now the trouble with machine learning is um, there isn't a, uh, a good source of data for robotics, okay? People are either creating their own in like confined environments that they control, or they are simulating it with uh, Unity or some sort of graphic engine, okay? And that's not, that's not gonna provide any real world data. So what we're doing is we have this system called Exosphere, and Exosphere allows um, people and companies to, to have their robots controlled by humans and all of the data that the robot is being that is generating is actually being saved in a machine learning database so that we can teach the ML how to complete the task. And we associate the task to a description. So, uh, I don't know, I'll just load up this, this one real quick here um, to show you. And this is, this is relevant to what we were just talking about. Is, so what's happening is, I mean, there's a lot of threads, all right, for anyone who understands programming. And I've been asked to move the robot here into the red zone. Okay, now this is just a demo robot. These are not like, like there's lots of robots that are connected to the system that you just don't get to see because people, it's not public, right? So what's happening is I'm controlling this robot in a physical location and it's doing something. Now, it was interesting is that how the, the, the engineer that we had writing part of this, he was uh, not super familiar with a lot of async stuff. So he actually had this piece of code that would, that would run and it would call an async function that had to send something to the server to create a request. Okay, so here's a server and this is the create request. Now there was no return, which meant that the compiler let this run on its own and then let other things happen. And how it created the request is there's this GUI, uh, GUID, sorry, that the system generates and it uploaded this GUID, said, hey, be prepared for um, a, a session. And then right after that, there was another one that said, okay, now I've started accepting this video. And it was another one that had no, and it sent it to the server, and it had no return. And then finally at the end, there was this um, function that said, okay, start, you know, start streaming or something. And it took us a long, long time to figure this out because on some computers, these would run and finish run and finish, and then when this, this was needed, right, because these were all dependent, this needed to be done, this needed to be done before this could be done, and when this one got called, they were all done, so everything would work, check. But um, then there was a situation where you'd be on a computer that might have been a little slower, or maybe a lot of processes was running, or even just the way the thread, um, the thread pool was managing the, the, the execution of these. This one would take a long time, this one may have completed, doesn't matter, and this one ran. And when it ran, there was no 
there was no data in here, right? So therefore it was trying to tell it to do something. So this was a really poor design and it took us a while to figure it out because when somebody writes code, um, you have to go through it and figure out what's going on. And it's hard to diagnose something like this because they were all running out of sync. If these all would return some sort of value and then this needed this return value before it could execute this and then this returned a value and then this needed, and this one here needed the return value, then the compiler would would uh, would know how to ex would say yes I can execute this in the proper order okay so that's that's asynchronous programming using built-in async I whipped up this quick little app to uh, to show you something so um, in reference to the exosphere <laughs> interesting part so this is how you can do some really bad multi-threaded programming uh, this is a tangent of course totally off from where uh, where we were discussing before so I have a button and on my form I can double click on the button. And this is the event that will be raised. Now I want to print out hello, then I want to print out goodbye. So hello sends the word hello to this function called log. And log delays for two seconds and then it prints the text. And then goodbye just prints the text to the, uh, to the window. Okay, so if I run this and you see hello and goodbye, you're going to think that they're going to run synchronously. There's no um, async methods in here. There's nothing calling it. And if you look at, if you dive in into, you know, hello, and now we're in hello, you can see there's no async in there as well. You think, okay, this is just a synchronous call. So let's run our program. And I'll push my, my button. And goodbye ran, and then hello, which is not what you would expect. Right? So um, this is example of really bad programming. And the reason why this happens is because you're trying to, well, you're not trying to, you're executing and awaiting commands in a void. And then void is not um, this. So I'll show you how to fix this. So if we want to await, I'll show you something. Await means wait for this to complete and then continue on, right? And you can't await a void, so there's no return type. So if we had this to set up as a task, now log is a task type, not a void, which means you can't just call log. You actually have to await log now because it's a task. So you see how it's highlighted with a warning? So let's await log now as we change the return type of log. Now it wants that. Now it's going to be an error saying, wait, you can't await inside of a regular um, method because it's not an async method. So now we have to give the method an async um, label. So now the compiler knows, okay, there's async, I have to await for things to finish in here. Okay, so now we're, the thing is, but we're, we're avoiding, we're, we're not returning anything, it's still a void, right? So in our main button, in our event, watch what happens, let's run it again. So do you think that's enough? And it's not going to be enough. Look, see, we still have goodbye before hello. And that's because we didn't go all the way up this, the stack, all the way up to the call stack to the beginning. So because hello is awaiting for log, that's still not enough. Now we have to tell hello that it is not void. Is also, it's a task. And then now that it's a task, we should see a warning. There it is for button one saying, hey, hello needs to be awaited. So let's make a hello await. And then we're gonna get a, another error because this is not inside of an asynchronous, me asynchronous method. So now let's async the method. And now our error will go away. So now the compiler knows that when this event is raised, that it needs to handle um, asynchronous calls. Now let's run our button. Hello, goodbye. Now, do you see that pause? That's our two second delay. So what was happening is this button, when this, when this event raises, it now knows it's asynchronous. It now knows that it has to await for hello to finish. So hello runs here. And when hello gets in, it has to await for log to finish. And then when log runs, it has to await for the delay to happen. And then it continues on with the rest of its code. And then when it's done, it returns all the way back up the call stack, all the way back up to here. And then now it can start running synchronous code. So in a, um, in a method 
where you want, you're not going to call an entire new thread. You might just want to um, you use the asynchronous calls. You could do it that way. Okay. Now, in reference to the program that we're talking about that for works with the NABU, um, I have a uh, NABU talk class here. And NABU, class, NABU talk runs... Let's see here. Where are we here? Where's my start? Read byte start task. There we go. So I actually, I mean, you could do it two different ways. You can say task that run, or you can say a new thread. Um, I'm trying to type with one hand here. So new system dot thread dot thread, and then we can give it our task. We can say start. All right. So we could do it that way too if we wanted. Uh, either one of these. So task run is nicer because it runs on the ta on the thread pool, where this you have to, you can also add parameters to this, which is nice. So you can say um, that you want this to run. Oops, not here. Here we can add a couple parameters. And we can say that we want this to run as a background thread. So it'll be entirely isolated on its own. Um, you for sure guaranteed to be on its own thread and any calls to the GUI need to be done inside of that thread through an invoke. So I don't have any anything here I can I can demonstrate that with, but um, in our inside of our main form here. Um, here we go. I bet you I do under disconnect. There we go. So this method can be called from a different thread because it can be raised. There's an event that can call it. And uh, that event will be from the thread that's actually sending information. So this piece of code at the top, now you don't always, this is not recommended all the time. It's a lot of times you're going to want to encapsulate specific thread, un, like unsafe thread calls to objects that are a different thread in their own invoke. That would be more, it's a little bit more uh, intensive on the, uh, on the CPU, but you're not going to get as much um, delay in your UI, right? Because this whole, all of this is going to run in the UI thread now. Because what I'm doing is I'm saying, does, when I enter this method, do I need to invoke? And if I do, then invoke this um, on the calling thread, okay, and re-execute this. So it's going to re-enter this method again, and then it's going to return when it's done. So when it comes back in, it's going to be entered again, invoked on the main thread, in which case it's going to run all the code, and then it's an exit. So this is all going to run on the main thread. Now, the reason why I did this lazily like this was because the everything here is on the on the main thread, on the GUI thread. So there's no point to running a new a new invoke action on the main thread for every single one of these individually. So it's okay to run all this. Um, but when you start getting into a lot of logic in here and loops and, and things like that, that can really slow down your UI. Now, another thread is essentially just another program just like this, right? Except you don't have any graphics because you're not talking to the GUI, you're on your own thread now. So if you want to, update, well, let's say we have a, a progress bar, and this is what happened in, in our program before, is we had this progress bar. This is my progress bar. Um, in order to update the progress bar, you have to invoke on this thread. So you have to send a command to the thread and say, I want you to execute this piece of code and do it to these objects or this particular object, or however you, you can specify it different ways. And now this piece of code that you execute, right? Like give this piece of code here, and you send that piece of code into this thread through a delegate, and now it delegates this thread and says, you do this, and now this updates. So it's not connected to, to here, they're separate, right? So that's, that's how, um, the program would work is that it would have a thread that would run that would run all of the communication between 
the NABU. So we receive data from the NABU and send data to the NABU. And that all happened inside of its own thread. Updating the display was in a different thread. That was in the GUI thread. So when people say run it in its own thread, they are correct in the sense that I ran it in my own thread. But you still have to consider that the CPU, where I erased the CPU, so the CPU only has so much processing capability. And so does it's generating graphics, right? It's generating graphics. That's what say graphics. I'll just put UI. So when this is trying to update, um, well, I guess the, the CPU is trying to take this and update the graphics. It's slowing the whole computer down, not just this thread, like the whole machine just kind of slows down because of that. So what was ironic is that the program was actually sending data more successfully to and from the NABU when my thread was calling this thread to update the progress, right? Isn't that neat? So the small amount of tax on this GUI update on the CPU was causing a delay that was the right amount, at least on my, my machines, for this communication to work. So that was really neat. So what I've done is I've removed the, um, the progress bar entirely because I had an option to turn it off, but, and, and cause on windows, it seemed like having it was great <laughs> for the, for the baud rate, uh, issue that we were having, but on slow computers, it was bad. So I put an option in the software. You can have a checkbox to remove it. And I decided to remove that checkbox because I didn't want to have two task bar or two progress bars because I have a TCP server set up as well. Now, it occurred to me that the TCP server doesn't need a, a, a progress bar because it doesn't actually broad send the information at a specific rate. It just fires it out as quick as it can, where the RS-242 or 422 needs to send it slowly. And that's why I like to see that progress bar. Now, um, but it's, un, it's irrelevant because we know the data is being sent. So I'm going to throw the progress bar back in today. <laughs> just to see if I if, if it makes a difference again because I have a feeling it's gonna work again and then that's gonna be super weird and I'll have to figure out that timing um, I'm also going to probe with my logic analyzer the uh, serial communication or the R it is still serial but the uh, RS422 communication between the NABU and the uh, and the PC and the through the adapter and I'm gonna do that with this so I'm just gonna hook this up to that and then I have a I have a couple different logic analyzers here somewhere. Do I have them in here? Yeah, I do. So I use these CLE ones. Um, I think this one's my bigger one. This is a, uh, yeah, this is a 16-bit uh, one. So this will do 16-bit processors, which is nice. There's 16-bit memory address spaces. There you go. You can see there's eight wires on per connection. So if you haven't seen a Sailee Logic Analyzer, um, I'll get that loaded later and then I'll show you guys how it works. And then I also have scopes and stuff too, um, but this is good for what we're going to be using because this will actually allow us to, uh, to see things exactly to like microsecond values without having to move and calculate on an, on an analog oscilloscope. But yeah, let me, let me get this running. Um, I'm going to upload this video anyway, just in the meantime, I'll do that now. I think it'll be fun. And yeah, I'll see you at the next video. Bye guys.